<laughs> I am uh, Phil Coburn. I joined the Army when I was uh, 17. And I've done five and a half years since. Uh, we come home. I got married, by the way, overseas. My bride and I uh, have been back about um, December of 1945. Uh, we lived out west, very wild out there. There's not too many. You ride horses to school and so on. So that's somewhat different what's happened today. So uh, I uh, picked up a few medals on my route as I went. I'll let, you, uh, I'll let Art get up and tell you uh, what he has experienced. Uh, yeah, well, as you know, my name is on the back there, Art Boyle. Uh, I landed D-Day, got up in the hall, was sent back. Otherwise, uh, not much. I brought a bunch of pictures to show you. And any questions you want to ask? Actually, did both of you, because Mr. Coburn was from the West and Mr. Boyle's from the East, can you tell us a little bit about the Depression and like the 30s just heading into war, sort of? What was life like? I'll let you go. Okay. <laughs> In 1929, my uh, family and our children and uh, our siblings came to Canada, immigrated, and uh, Things were pretty tough in 1929. Not only 29, we were very tough for that 10-year uh, gap there. Uh, you go back to where there's uh, no one has any money. The markets have all collapsed. You know, it's pretty hard to uh, get any work. However, I did a little job. I was quite young at the time. Um, but as soon as the war broke out, as soon as there was all kinds of money. Everybody had money. But wherever they got it from, I was just <laughs> But it, it was pretty hard times. Food, due to the fact that we were on a farm, we, we fared pretty well. Uh, but like tea, coffee, and things like sugar, and things of this nature, we made our own bread, our own cakes, so we made our own. Uh, we took our grain to the elevator with two, a team of horses for a big ground up. And you have flour for the for the whole year. And you have a cream of wheat, which we ate, and because we didn't have any money to buy anything else. So it was it was pretty rough. Who wants to see that? I got east. Well for me I grew up down east in the garden spot of Canada. Gatsby, Gatsby, Quebec. And I spent pretty near nine years in the Army. Uh, I was in the Army before the war on horseback. So I brought a few pictures to show you <laughs> of my horses. <laughs> and then otherwise, from then on, I was in the active Army and overseas. Now, any questions you want to ask or anything? I brought a picture to show you. Now, going back, uh, when we went over D-Day, we got it pretty rough. And uh, I brought a picture to show you of one of our tanks that was sunk in the English Channel. And it was brought up to the surface, I think, in 50, 72 or something around that time. It was 72. Yeah. They brought it ashore and cleaned it all up. And it's on a monument over there in Carcel Samar. By the way, I was down to see the kids from uh, Carcel Samar here all the week. Uh, Phil and I. It was a class of the bowler from there. And I'll pass that picture around and you can have a look at it. That's our tank over in France. Not the one down, there's one in Victoria Park, but that's in France. The one in Victoria Park's one of your tanks too, isn't it? Yeah, that's one of our tanks too, yeah. Yeah, they're both our tanks. So, I don't know, you got any questions, I'll try and answer them and then I'll show you some pictures. What made you two want to join the Army? Well, 
it was a very easy decision because the, the way of life, so the army broke, uh, the army was called on the 3rd of September of 1939. So uh, we just thought your friends joined, your schoolmates all joined, so we just all joined. It was simple. Because it, when you, all your friends go away, you left by yourself. So we just all got together and did what we thought was right in the beginning. So that's how that happened. I guess you probably all heard a lot about D-Day. I brought a picture of, of our beaches where we went in. That's there's where, there's where we landed. There in there. See all them the Kennedy did. Yeah. On the beaches. And I don't know if you're interested in medals. I'll show you some here. That's just uh, I'll pass it. You can pass it over. French Bernard is talking there in the pictures. Uh, I'm going to go back to uh, to D Day, which was the 6th of June, 1944. It was supposed to be the Senate. That the, mm -hmm. the water was rough, so I just said, postponed it. Well, it's uh, French, it's, uh, no, it's the so French. So when we, uh, went I, I the next morning, we're already up, it's just a matter Second. of your eyes. The eyes don't <laughs> There's no beds. So we got up I, the I got the morning, and it was much That's just a picture of uh, the boys going in, some of them D-Day. I got it, I got that. We just had to go, because the English Channel was getting overloaded with with uh, craft to, to enter into the shores of France, and uh, it just had to go. So there were six tanks on a on a barge, it's a flat bottom boat. Hold six tanks. Each tank weighs 34 tons. So you can imagine. What, uh, and the one was on the back door. The last one he's on the gate back. So when they let that gate down, so then the tank. These tanks that I talked about. Oh, there it is, is uh, uh, what we call DD tanks, the floating water. And how they float, the 32 air pillars, several struts. Then, and that's what there they are in our you want to, to read it. We, as I said, we had six on our craft. And uh, the skipper of the boat decided we better get clear here. So he's, he's giving the order down the door. And these are. And this is not away from the water. They're after the water. From, That's from, awesome. from the beaches. And these are two French mills. All the tanks That's got off. Like given to we got off. We saw nothing because the only one that see anything is the crew commander because he was up steering the thing. Yep. That's how he. It used to go six miles yeah. an hour. So it's very slow. So we, we, uh, we entered the. Uh, the shore, the, the shore, the beach, and we looked around very quickly, and I saw no other tank. So that added up to be that the six, five tanks that was on there just went down. We didn't get to where we were, so we were run out of that six uh, tanks. Tell you what, 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 no doubt there's probably other instances uh, of something similar, but we've never seen that. In honor of King, this. King and Queen Jessica. So I want you to lose uh, five tanks yeah. in a critical time like this. Then, what is it? Is it like a Yeah, the guard for them while so they were there on per when they or yeah. they traveled. We, we went was, like that. That's right. It was just terrible the first. And that's when I was younger. For several yeah. weeks or even that's when I got months, older. we ate only corn. That corned beef and, and there's one heart tank. The boy. It's called heart, like a real dog yeah. biscuit, hard heart. Or young, and so I guess that's why we uh, had a liver. Yeah. So we got sort of used to it. So some weeks later, or even months, 
they moved to the kitchen and my astronauts would have two astronauts, A and B. Now B astronaut would be the one the first away from the front. I, you're right the there. You stayed right in Paris. Fairly close, right but not close no. to, to wipe it out. So we got with ammunition and gas for our tanks. And sometimes we yeah. do not sleep, uh, and sometimes not at all. The EA was, uh, was just a terrible time. It was something that maybe never happened. Okay. Good. The rough, the crossing was pretty rough, from what I understand. That's very rough. Very rough. Yeah. And how was it getting the tanks off the barges and into the water? Well, I was on that. I, I was on a barge. Were you? Yeah. Yes. It wasn't very nice. Uh, we spent. You got the same. <laughs> You've got the same one as I've got today. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I was on the, on the barge, and uh, when we went off, we went off, you know, I went off in about eight feet of water, I think, when we went off of the barge, onto the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, well, long, long story, but we, <laughs> we survived it anyway. We got farther inland. Now, you're, you, both your tanks made it in off the barge and you stayed Well, he wasn't on a barge. You were oh. floating. <laughs> you were floating it. And you I was on a barge. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We, uh, the barge took us in as far as they could go right. until they were on the ground. Right. Then we drove off. Right. So and we didn't get a very good welcome. And who got wetter? <laughs> <laughs> Me. <laughs> I'm sorry, you. <laughs> no, I didn't get wet. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's on. We were on the gutter. We were on, the, uh, on this part, we went on, on uh, we were supposed to go on the 5th, and it was too rough. <coughs> but I was still on the barge on the channel, and what all they done is circle around and around and around. And then... Because you couldn't get off. No, then the next day, that's when we went in the 6th. But uh, uh, I was so seasick, it didn't matter much if they shot me or not. But, but <laughs> that was, I was that sick. And did they do any, I mean, what special training did you do to prepare, prepare for the D-Day landing? Pardon? What special training for the D-Day landing did you have to do? Well, uh, we, we used to go up, uh, I was up in northern Scotland in the Hebrides, and we trained there, like, going off and on the barges and stuff like that. And, of course, we had our gunnery school and different, you know, all the training in it. But that's, that's the only... The only uh, yeah, train we had, we had a we had a little talk before before we went over. We told us that a lot of us weren't coming back, which were, which was right. Apart from that, uh, not much. Uh, not much else I can tell you. I'll let you want to ask a question. I've just got a little bit to add to that, just uh, so, because if I don't say it now, <laughs> we train with tanks, this very type of tank, for uh, almost three years, about two and a half years. And we used to do all our training at night, because this was a secret. To look at this tank, it looked like a big canvas something. Just didn't look like a tank at all. So we, we used to train underwater. It's one of them, and I can't swim even today, I can't swim. They would have a, a, about this size of a room here in the ground, oh, 20 foot deep perhaps. And there sat this tank. Our, our instructor would tell us, we only had to come on this one, okay, that's all we had on And uh, he would tell you, before going down, that he would tap you on the shoulder, and when you get the tap on the shoulder, you, you, you surface. And if you don't surface right, then you go down again the next time. So, and I, I was scared of water, and I didn't surface right. Oh, and then I was faced with another one. However, we used to get down there, and then outside of that ta the tank, uh, we would be, have ropes in something similar to walk along under the water. We, had, we used to wear these, uh, they called the Davis escape apparatus, 
And those uh, uh, oxygen, and you could stay underwater for a while. But when you wear them, and you go down in the water coming up to here, when we were sitting in the tanks at the, in the bottom of this big pool, you couldn't surface until you got the tap on the shoulder. And this, it filled up very quickly because it was very large pipes running in here. So it's a matter of 30 seconds or maybe less that this hole would fill up over the tank. So when this water was coming up on you, you felt like, well, wait a minute, I got a lot of things to do. You had to put your ears plug, no, you put your earplugs in, you put your nose piece on, you blew on the bag, and that was the surface before you put the mug piece in and go to oxygen. So and if you missed any of these things, uh, like myself, you can't swim, but very, very excited. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I learned the hard way. And, it takes a lot of training to be on one of these tanks to know this tank and what it can do. So it was sort of like a mind that I never forget. Mm -hmm. How many people were in each tank? Five. And what are the different roles in the tank? Like, what does everybody do? Well, what did you do? You can do that. I'll give you a little idea what. Uh, what we went when we when we went in, we were, as I say, on these barges, and be, out behind us was the navy, with all the big battleships and so on. And as we were going in on the beach, all this artillery and guns and everything were fired over the top of us. Plus, we had the air force up overhead dropping bombs. Uh, supposedly to neutralize the beaches and let them uh, knock out the pillboxes and so on, which they didn't do much. Uh, so you can imagine what what we had. This is uh, still dark. All this fire going on. And then we had all the Germans in there. The whole beach is firing out at us. So we were kind of in the in the middle. That's uh, something. I brought uh, pictures of, of some of these pillboxes over there. Yeah, I can show you. Go ahead if there's any more questions you want anywhere. What regiments are you guys in? First is ours. First is ours regiment. It's, uh, it's 150 years old with a birthday uh, sort of party for this occasion. Uh, we have on our flag, we we have what they call a gion, and it's a, just a flag like this. And in the First World War, there are rattle lockers built right in there. And the color of the, this flag I talk about is red with uh, golden uh, train falling from the center. And on that flag, we ourselves, I think we have either six or eight battle lines. Those were, was, you know, I think, four or something. First ones on there. So we, we almost like doubled the battle line. And that was the one before we got that. Still, uh, I have one at home in a, in a case. It's much bigger than, than this one here. I used to have my medal all around there at one time, but that didn't work very well. I decided to try them another way. I got some, <coughs> some pictures here of, of the some of the fortifications that we run into. Like, like when, when the, on the beaches. This, this is taken after like after the war when I went back. When we were over there. But that's that's the for that's the bunkers. Any more questions? And here there must be a lot of questions. These are all pictures and you you can read on the backs what they are. That's the Bay, Bayou Cemetery. That's where most of my friends are, in there. Uh, did it ever feel cramped inside a tank? Like you, did it ever feel cramped? Cramps? Cramps, small, claustrophobic. It is. 
How did I get to Europe? Yeah. You mean? Like here. Oh, from here? Yes. Oh, we went over on a big ship, a big uh, 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 freighter, like a, a Ronsi, they called it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's how we went over. The whole, the whole regiment, like on the, on the, on the one ship. And what was the trip over like? Very rough. rough. <laughs> not, not, not the best. <laughs> And the food and stuff? I, I gotta walk down around because I Absolutely. my hair's go my hearing's going gone and I and I my memory's going too. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you guys see any of the uh, sort of outfitted contraption tanks like flail tanks and so on? Did we have any of that? Do you guys see any of the like flail tanks that Yeah, well we had the wooden flail tanks. Yeah. Yeah, we had the wooden. Maybe you, you two can explain what the role of the tanks were because, um, I mean, it's different than being in the infantry for sure. So what what was the role of the tanks, say, on D-Day and then throughout Europe? Well, we had each, uh, we had A, B, and C squadron, and we were all with uh, Regina rifle, Winnipeg rifle, and the Canadian Scottish. That was our division that we were supporting. Uh, we went in a and the infantry, well, the tanks went in more or less with the infantry on on the on the beaches and uh, and in. We were we were supposed to be supporting them uh, as they landed, like on the you know as the infantry got in. The infantry, of course, were all on barges and landed on the beaches, or not? They didn't get right to the beach; they got in the water. But uh, I showed I had a picture there of, of uh, wasn't there there. Well, no, that's not still show the beach, but that's more or less up right there. You see it, did you? Yeah, it's that one there. That's that shows you like uh, that's coming out off of the beaches. The fellows there, they're coming out of the water. To give you some idea of the size of the beach, these our beaches uh, is Juno Beach. <coughs> still there, and, and close by is a, is a monument. A very nice building, quite large. To give you the size of okay. the beach, not only ours, but okay, I got it. the whole okay. Allied yep. beach, yep. there were 4,800 bombers. That's a bomber is a plane. Each plane carries eight 16 bombs. So you can imagine what that would sound like when we were on the tanks going across on this barge for some time. You could just see it was daylight. 7.55 was our landing time. Uh, it did change a little bit. Some of you may be going over some of these days. What? No, there's a there's a few people talking about going yeah. over to uh, on the Vimy. They'll be stopping at the Normandy beaches. There's uh, a picture of a, a French family that was. Uh, I took a picture of it. Uh, that were a D Day. That's a French family that that was there when we landed, like uh, in Carcel somewhere. I, I took a picture of it. There's a little picture of the cemetery in Benny Samar, and that's that tank again I had on the big picture. And that's the cemetery again. And that's the uh, video cemetery. What was the major role of the 
And that's the same thing, pay you a summer. In a tank? Or what did you have to do? You want to look at in a tank crew, there are five people yeah. in the tank. These are, these are my own photos that took after. Commander, That's not George Ward. The and the wireless operator. And they like to be, each one, uh, know the other four people who work with what to do. So, uh, and I was one of the four people and I was interested in, and I got to be with five. Uh, not a lot of people do these things no, because it's the satisfied being a the commander or something. But that's, and the reason for that, that is uh, if your tank gets knocked out, you have four other people in the tank can take over. In other words, if the driver got hit and the gunner knows how to drive what he was going so but it didn't all work like that but that was a system that they, they'd like to know so each time you got a, a step up but also ten cents for a day you got that put on to your dollar 25 cents now we're down to 35. now when you know morse code and signals which in radio you get another 10 cents. So I, I think that, that is when you get all of this put together, I think I was something like 30 cents more than the basic rate. So we didn't spend a whole lot of money at one point. <laughs> um, since your arrival in Europe, how many countries were you fighting in? Well, we fought in uh, France, and then from France, we. Uh, we didn't do very much fighting at all, the tanks didn't, in, in, uh, in, Holland, in uh, Belgium. Belgium. We didn't even take our tanks off the tank, off the transport, tra right through. But then when we got, got to Holland, uh, that was a different story. And we had it pretty rough going up around Calais and Boulogne and Dieppe and different places all up through there all up along the coast. They didn't give us a very good reception. <laughs> Come all that way and they don't treat you very nice. No. Uh, it's better now. <laughs> you want to tell us about Holland because it's Holland that we've been looking at? Okay. It? Holland is our friends, our very best friends. What they did for us when we entered Holland, they were just so happy. That we arrived. We were coming out onto the streets where we were moving. We didn't stop unless we had a business to do. And so we kept on going. And they were thrown uh, uh, tulips. Tulips. They were thrown out, and they're very comfortable. Well, they, we knew then that these people are so happy. And not only those people themselves, but prior to that, we had uh, from, uh, from uh, Dieppe, uh, which is two years before, it was in 2042, but that turned out not good. We lost a lot of men there because we didn't have enough power to, so uh, we were, they took something like 350 uh, of our people at the Dieppe, they call it the Dieppe Ray, which is a mistake all the way around. And talking of mistakes, I go back to the tank that we had, and all means were the same. There were fire, there were uh, the, the petrol, what they call petrol, and it, was, it was gasoline. Uh, we had a six pound gun, which was nothing like the 88. So we had a lot of stuff that was sort of second best. Well, when you have second best, you're going to get into trouble somewhere along the way. Uh, when you got hit with an 88, it would go in one side, go right out to the other side. That's how powerful these 88s were. And in doing so, when that happened, the, the tank caught on fire and nobody could get up. So we lost a lot of 
men, uh, it, it wasn't stupidity, <coughs> it was something that was overlooked on the, on the whole system here, that gasoline should never be even close to the tank, and that happened. Now, the, to, to get on the brighter side of this, some two months or more, they come up with new, brand new tanks. Well, that was just like Christmas to us. <laughs> and they had 17 power on there. And they had uh, 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 the motors was diesel. And that doesn't burn unless it gets very hot. And then it won't blow. So we, and then we had our 17 pounders. We only had a few and they were behind the three. And the troop is three here, and the one behind, he overlooks. So if you do happen to get into an 88 over here, you always call it huddle down positions. There's different things that you do so you can, if you're huddled down, you can still fire the gun. But if you're turret down, you see nothing. So the turret down wasn't what we wanted to do because we wanted to get the enemy here. We don't want to just play second best. So as I said, we had the 17 pounders on uh, with diesel motors. And uh, we thought, we were, well, we could go along there and see an 88 and give him some of the stuff that he was giving us prior to getting uh, upgraded, we'd call that to it. So we felt good about that. And then all about this time, the kitchens, uh, I don't know, I think six weeks or not even, maybe two months before they brought the kitchens over to feed us. Now, in the meanwhile, this is six weeks, if not, no, if not this more. This is in Holland? And, uh, no, in it was France. before we got to Holland. Oh, okay. They would uh, give this bully beef and heart attack, as I mentioned, and that's all we had to eat. There was no other. We had no beds. We had a, a, ro a, a bed drove all uh, in, on the back of our tank, which I bet we got hit at the time. And we, too. But we were fortunate in a lot of ways, and very unfortunate in too many ways. Um, yes? How far did you guys go? Did you guys go all the way to Germany or did yes. you stop at home? Yes. I had a, a, another tank, a DD tank went across the Rhine. And that was a little trick, the Rhine River. It runs at six knots, and our tanks in the water run at six knots. But the night before, this was on the 17th of March, and on the other side, the engineers went over there and laid pads where they thought that we would touch down. When water's coming this way, and you're going that way, so you have to come in to an intersection here of the water flow and the tank speed. And if you didn't hit the pad, the pad wasn't very big. If you didn't hit the pad, then you just swirl around like this and there's no way you So I happened to be the driver of this, this tank. And this tank was equipped with all Air Force radios. And uh, they, were, they did that for a reason. Took all our stuff out. We had a big old 19 set. It could go, uh, you could call uh, 18 miles a week, that was it. it was very good. So they took all that out, put their Air Force things in here, and then on the 17th of March, 3.30 in the morning, we got an early start here. And by, you know, we were very lucky again. Hit the pad. A guy by the name of Sergeant Garrity, probably heard him, I was his driver going over into Germany. That we were the first to enter Germany. And there was nobody there. Was the Germans? No, they weren't even there. They, they, back, they knew we were there. So I think that was the, the breaking point right then. So very quickly they put up a pump, what's called a pump bridge, and then the, all the traffic can get on. The and uh, we didn't hear anymore. It ended really to us, the war was over on the 4th of May. But due to the fact of having enemies signing our documents, we signed theirs, and that took like three or four days to do that. Uh, we've done the whole thing in 
11 months. That's how long it took us to go from shores of France to into Germany and war over 11 months. So that was the day. Um, meanwhile, back in Holland, uh, what was the situation you found the Dutch people in when you got there? Oh, you'd have to tell me. <laughs> I never got out to talk. <laughs> the Dutch people, what was the question? What, what was the situation of the Dutch people when you got to Holland? Almost one word could explain that. Starvation, believe it or not. They used to uh, have balls, uh, two balls. They used to boil those, like we would boil uh, potatoes, and that's what they ate. The Germans had just taken everything from them. There's a place over in, Ger in, in Holland, close to German lines. It's the, the host family that I was with, they took me down, and they have a statue. Uh, with a can of milk, and this is not real milk, it's a statue of it, pouring down, right? Pouring down. And at that statue, there were two people shot, two Dutch people, because the Germans come and took their milk. You had, if you didn't give them your milk, you get shot. So you had to make it come out real quick. And uh, that's what I thought to myself, and they, my host family explained all of this. And it, it just was terrible how the Germans would do to their neighbor in the country to, to try to come up. I said, well, you surely they must have known uh, after we got out of France, we took them out of France, what would make them think? We're not going to take them in and push them back into their own country. They didn't, they thought they were. Mr. Hitler was, he had all the people behind him. All the people. And that was, yes. When you were in Holland, what was your major uh, role? What did you have to do in Holland? Within a tank, you mean? Or, like, what was your mission? What were you supposed to do? Keep pushing the Germans back to the room. Were there many battles? On oh, the every day. Yeah. What we used to do, too, I'm glad I had this. We used to lay smoke screen. We had smoke bombs in our tank. And when it started to get a little bit dark, we would uh, lay a smoke screen down in front. And, uh, the Germans was over here. We lay a smoke screen here. Our people, infantry, would begin their slit trench. And then uh, sometimes if the ground was hard, take a little longer to do this. So they were, we were in connection with them by phone. By, Earplugs, that's what turns me. And uh, we would say, okay, we'll lay another. Or if it was windy, we could move that smoke out of there. And we didn't want that because they were right up pretty tight to the German line. So we'd lay, lay another one back down there. So we'd do that until they said, okay, we're happy, we're in, we're settled. And then we would very slowly, one tank at a time, would back out. Only either. You don't want a whole lot of noise made because the German people would read this and say, okay, they're gone, we can go now. So you had to do this. And we'd go and get our tanks all filled up and we'd get some more ammo in there. And if you're lucky, get a little rest or sleep even. But not, not as often as we would like. That's the, that's the, the role of a, a tank. How hard was it to move the tanks in Holland? Because they did a lot of flooding there, yes? Yeah. Yeah. We bogged down a few, yeah, but we seemed to just get wrecked and pull us out. Another tank equipped with, with the winches on it and so on. So, yes. Um, was everyone in the tank trained to operate all parts of it, or were you just specialized? They, no. As a rule, the driver was your driver. Right? My driver was, uh, he was uh, there all the time. He, he was, and neither did the others. These things I was talking about, the like five in a tank, well, 
I was so anxious to know, you know, to know what uh, the Morse code. But it was just terrible to learn Morse code. See, I, because it just did some dots. And if they say it too quickly, you miss. But the fact is, if you missed one, don't try to figure that word out or that letter out. Go to the next, say with a key. And, that, and then when you're finished, you can almost uh, say, oh, yeah, why did I miss it? You can make it up. So that was a part of the training that do not lose the key. Stay with the key. Some mornings, especially Monday mornings, people would like like a lower key than normal because they had been out to the wet canteen the night before and they weren't feeling very good. And then the people that didn't go to the canteen, well, we can't even read that. You know, it's way too low. It's gurgling. It's, you can't read it. It has to be a sharp, high pitch key to, to be able to read it good. So that there's no mistake in a, a dot and a doll, that's what they used to call it. It gets to be in just a spot and a dot and a you used to have to uh, send at uh, ten words a minute, which wasn't bad, and we received at five, because it's a little harder to receive than it is to send. Because you know what you want to send. And, but if they send back to you, you don't know. So you have to, again, stay with the key. But there wasn't too many, you know, I'm not toot my own horn here, but I was very anxious to know from those days. I want to know everything. And I got to know quite a bit about things. How how was it what was it like to take on the panthers? The the other tanks? What was it like to take on the enemy tanks? Well, <laughs> it was, well, like, you, you go to meet somebody with a revolver, <laughs> and you got one. Whoever gets the best shot off was about it. Well, just, you had to be lucky. Yeah, that's about the story of that, really. What were the most difficult tanks to take down? What were the most difficult tanks to take down? The most difficult thing that I done? No, the mo most difficult tanks to take down. The hardest tank. The hardest tank. The German eighty-eight. The, the the Tiger tank was the big the big one. Yeah, that was the big German tank. And how did you go on taking them out? How, how did, did you take them out? How did you blow them up? How did you blow? Yeah. Well, <laughs> how did you take them out? You mean? Yeah. Well, your uh, our old gun. I had a big gun. I had a 17 pounder. And it wasn't quite a match for the 88, but pretty near. So whoever got the best shot off or got, you know, in a position, that's how you got them. I uh, landed on D Day with uh, I had a tank with a 17 pounder. There were only three in the regiment on that. But I wasn't with Phil on that barge. I was on another barge. And uh, we had a, uh, I was with a troop, we had three tanks, 17 pounders, and the other, all the rest of the squadron were with the 76s. Uh, we only had, we, we just, they just came in, but just before D Day, and I got one of them, and it was a, a troop. There was a, a sergeant, a left handed, and a corporal. Uh, when we landed, like the three of us, um, my uh, troop officer was killed on the beach. And he was only about 22 years old, and he was from Woodstock. And from that on, I went, got on with the rest of the regiment and uh, went on uh, all through France. I can't tell you too much about Holland because I, I wound up in uh, Holland in Breda. That's the last last place I was in, and they sent me back to England, getting shell shot, I guess. <laughs> so anyway, I went back to England, and I worked, I was on the training course there uh, in England, and I went to a, 
a tank training school in England, uh, the Royal, one of the Royal Marines places. When I came back from that, they said, you're going back to Canada. So they shipped me back to Canada the day I landed in the Montreal, the war was over. That, that's about my history of it. Yeah. Did, uh, yeah. did you spend Christmas in, uh, in, in Holland? Did I wait? Did you have Christmas in Holland? No, I wasn't there that far for long. There. No, I left in uh, October. Okay. <laughs> I only got to Breda. That's right. Yeah, okay. two couple of places, a couple of little out of little town, and then Breda was the last place. So where did you get your military medal? In France. In France. In France. At Caen or, or no. further on? No, uh, before that. Oh, before Caen. Yeah. Okay. Up around Breton. So were you in, in Christmas in Holland? Uh, yeah. Did they do anything special for you? Well, <laughs> uh, we didn't have a Christmas. <laughs> yes, we did, we, but it was a little bit late. It was the 6th of January when we had our Christmas dinner. Uh, the reason being, we were very close to uh, a little island there in Nijmegen area. And there's an island in there. So our officers and people uh, said, well, there's a possibility that the Germans just could land on that island. So let us not do that. Let us put somebody there. So we, our Sergeant Major, he, his name was Sergeant Major Fig. And we were all set up. This was like Christmas Eve. And we were all set up. We had that drum ration and we sort of saved that up so I have a little party, you know. And uh, Sergeant Major Fate come down and he said, We're moving in twenty minutes. Fuck so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not such a thing. But he said, We will move in twenty minutes. So all this put together little party we're gonna have just fell apart. Went over to the aisle. And uh, I was the first, uh, it was guard duty, but when you're going to a strange place, you just don't get out of the tank and have a guard duty. 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Two on, four off, that was the, yeah, like three to a mm -hmm. guard duty. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so that's... Uh, Oh, I, uh, I was going to mention something else, but I guess I didn't. Look out mind. I'll tell you a little bit when we land. We didn't have much food with us, only what we could uh, take along in the tank a little bit. So a little further up we ran out of, out of food, so we didn't have anything to eat. So we get in the French garden. I remember uh, having a meal of Brussels sprouts. <laughs> you, can, you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, our sleeping accommodation, of course, we didn't have any beds or anything. We slept, uh, mostly slept under the tank because we usually got bombed at night. <laughs> so we <laughs> slept under the tank. And I won't say for sanitary reason, <laughs> we didn't have any water. <laughs> so you just stayed right like you were till, you, till we got further up. Then we got showers. <laughs> the odor at this time was pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> and hot, yes. Hot is right. Flies, wasps, everything. Were yeah. there punishments if you dis uh, disobeyed the generals? Oh, yes. Did they win? Punishment. <laughs> well, who, uh, who, who, us? Yeah. Did we have any punishment? Yeah. We did if we were bad. <laughs> but we didn't, we didn't over there because it, Nobody was there to punish you. <laughs> yeah. Not too much. In peacetime, not. In peacetime, yeah. You would. Uh, they had different bugles for different uh, people that were serving time in the order room. You had to be in the order room, answer every call, and if you missed a call, you were put. In more. So you had to be pretty good. This was in Canada, mainly. Overseas, it, it didn't mean too much. Even in England, that didn't mean too much. And it meant less when we got 
into here, into it. So the, uh, the, the answering of the, uh, you call it defaulters. You could get up to, if you're real bad, you could be court-martialed. Yeah. But you had to be really bad. But uh, the normal run of things, it would be from about three days, you can get it 11 days and 12 days too. Yeah, but that was sort of like the limit that they were then uh, court martial then you did. In our regiment, in our old regiment, see I wasn't with the Hazars only for one year before D-Day. In our own regiment, there was a guy uh, was stealing stuff from the other people in the barracks. And they took him, and he had other things against him also. They took him in front of the regiment, and I just never thought I'd ever see that. They pulled buttons off and stripped him and gave him a dishonorable discharge. That's the only one I know of that did that. So he was, he just done a whole lot of bad things. <laughs> What was your happiest moment of the war? Well, <laughs> I guess uh, probably it would be with the equipment uh, and, uh, upgrading. Or it might have been meeting your wife. Well, that was another one, too. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't scared of her as much as I was of the other people. Yeah, probably a little of both, yeah. When you get the right kind of uh, equipment uh, to equalize the people on the other side, then we felt good about that. Because it was a case of who knocks them out first. And there was one thing wrong with the German tank. They had two types of tanks, German. That, the Tiger and the Panther. They were, again, with the uh, 88s. When you, uh, I just lost my train there for a second. Two types of tanks. Yeah, there, there are two types of tanks. And after we got our tanks, we could, we're equalized. And that gave you a good feeling that you would, you know that if you see a German tank, uh, we, we would take him. And the reason being, all our tanks was power travelers. So that you just push it over like this and it comes just about so quick. Yeah. The German tanks, both German tanks, had hand travels so that it would just go move about one of these. By the time he got on looking somewhere else, we had it. Because he, he, could, he saw us, but he was probably swinging to try to get on. No. See, in the order that you get as a gunner, I was a gunner is uh, 500 yards, church steeple, and he would tell you left or right, you would start coming around, them. you know what you're looking for already. We had, everybody had ear muffs on, because it's noisy. So he, he would say, steady on target. And then you, he told you what it was. It's church, church steeple. That was the first thing that I knocked down uh, was a church thing. <laughs> and uh, you know why? Because they, were, they had a sniper up there. And they were firing at our, at our infantry. And uh, it's hard to tell for them, where is it coming from? But we, to, and we didn't, hear the, we didn't hear the sniper ever since. So that was the first shot. And then right after that, gunfire, Five rounds of gunfire when ready. So you fire here, you go a little, another here, and as you were wanting to go a little further, you would raise your gun just a little bit, make that arch. But don't get too high because it'll, it'll shorten on you. There's a certain point of, of, of this arch. And uh, we got pretty active with those things. Uh, we have a shell in now. It would blow in the air. It was a seven-minute fuse on the, on the top of the shell, and you set it for say maybe five, and it was a marker. 
and the OP out in front there, he would be talking to our crew commander, crew commander would relay it to us, and uh, that's how we come to be accurate. And it was fired, and it would explode, and the, the, the officer up front would say short, and it's, it's short. So, um, so as soon as you got the right one, then you know the, the range, then we'll just put poof, poof, all over. The Germans thought we had automatic guns. <laughs> Something about the gun, uh, it's a little like a dimmer switch on a car, it used to be on the floor, and you're on the switch. You put your foot on there and leave it on. So when he, when the breech block fired, the breech block let the gun come down, and it could uh, recall 24 inches. And then you would slide in another one. As soon as you, you get, your loader would slide in another one, I'm already now on the target. So as soon as the the forks, the, I forget what they call now, as soon as they went ahead, it would release it and block went back up. As soon as it went back up, it was gone. Just a second, maybe less. So that's what you call gunfire. We didn't make a practice of doing that because it it been done. Um, how many shells does the tank hold? As many as <laughs> you can possibly get in. <laughs> Just a whole lot of space. We used to have them stacked up on the floor. Not supposed to do that, mind you. But yeah, we took just as many as we could handle. Um, this is for both of you. Do you regret joining or being part of the war, or do you think it was a self-satisfying experience? All right. Do it so that that I didn't get that. what uh, did you enjoy in the army? Did you join yourself? Is there any enjoy yeah. Did I enjoy myself? You said. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, I did before the war uh, a little bit. Yes, I I I was stationed uh, I was stationed just outside of Montreal, St. John's, Quebec, and uh, we could uh, nip into Montreal all the time. So. We, we done pretty good there. <laughs> we were on horseback <laughs> at that time. Going back to the tank, my, my tank, I had a, a little different tank than what Phil had. We, the whole regiment was equipped with uh, with what you see in Victoria Park, you know? You know I guess yeah. if somebody had been down around there. That tank, that was a, a the typical tank, but I had a little different one. I had a bigger gun on it. Uh, I had a 17-pounder on mine, and I only had a crew of four. And we uh, were the, used to what they call a co-driver, used to sit down in the front with the machine gun. Uh, we done away with him and that was all ammunition because uh, we had bigger shells and we had to stow all in there. So we wound up with uh, just a crew of four. And from that on, yep. Did you have no machine gun in there? Pardon? Did you have no machine gun in there? Uh, yeah, one, well, with the one alongside of the big gun. You could use it or the big gun, but that's all. They just had the one, I had a, what they call a loader operator, a wireless operator, and a loader. And then the gunner, and myself, and the driver. That's all there was in our tank. Yeah. I think Aaron's been, yeah. Um, What's he Holland, got? In Holland, which like battle or which city had the most resistance? In Holland? Yeah. As I say, I don't know too much about Holland. I was, uh, resistance when we, as far as I went, but I didn't go very far. No. Uh, Phil can tell you more about that. Yes. Uh, what was the most challenging thing that both of you had to face during the war? Charging. Challenging. Challenging. Well, it was all the challenge, too. Uh, some was easier to do than others. The more men in the right place at the right time, less challenge. Were either of you ever injured? Injured? Mm -hmm. Slightly. Slightly. We got uh, hit with an 88 in the gun shield. And the gun shield was three and a half, three and a half inches. Shell went right through. 
crew commander's here, the gunner's there, the loader operator's here, and the driver's there. And you come right through, and I just got a little chip off, and it hit me just on the hip here. Uh, much, didn't much more than just bleed. <laughs> so I was like, another range probably would have been game over. But that's what he said. Did either of you suffer from shell shock? No. Some has. And it was, uh, when I say some, there was quite a number, really. We ourselves in our tank, uh, his name is uh, DJ, DJ Jones. And he, was, uh, he was a motor operator. And he couldn't, he just couldn't take it. He just uh, was going crazy. So we had to take him out, put another one in. And he went back at the, uh, into Ashland, and I think in some work cleaning clothes or something. Marshall but, has a question. Uh, throughout the war, what kept you guys going? Like, it kept making you want to fight more and more and help those people? Well, somebody had to do it. And we were there, and that's what we went for, so that we could live the life that we're leading today. Had this not happened, should we have lost? It would, uh, I don't know what it would be like, really. I just sometimes wonder. But we didn't lose, and we're thankful for that. And, and new people are here, and that's what it was all about, to make sure that our country was safe. This, were you ever forced to abandon your tank and fight on foot? Climbing. Did you ever leave your tank and have to fight? Oh, no. No, 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 no. You never get out of the tank. That's where you, when you're in action, everything is closed down. But the gunner has a scope. Um, the gunner has, the driver has, and the crew commander has. There are three scopes and they can see where they're going. Now the driver, he doesn't much go by scope, he goes by uh, like our talk, what we, we talk about. And he, uh, that's the way we used to rely on one another that much and, uh, when you hit it. And, uh, on the other hand, it's, uh, it's a kind of a thing when, uh, if, if you can stand, it was, they just try to, just to the limits, you know.